they were all long-term rentals. We are talking about getting into short-term rentals and stuff like that, but they're long-term rentals and our kind of strategy is buy and hold, knowing that, you know, the real estate market, like the stock market, you know, over the long term, it, it tends to go up. There's obviously short-term volatility, but so, you know, we kind of have a, a buy and hold strategy. We're actively accumulating more and sort of, as we started, like I said, I was, I was and still am in a huge amount of student debt. So we're paying that off really aggressively. And so the amount of money that we could decided to set aside for real estate was more what would buy us in the, you know, small multifamily category. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Jordan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Sam. Hey, the, the pleasure's all mine. Uh, can you quickly tell our listeners, you know, where'd you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? Uh, but before you do, tell us um, maybe what you've been up to all night long and what it took to get you on the podcast this morning. <laughs> I, I was up all night operating, which doesn't sound like something a plastic surgeon typically does, but I, I am in the one area of plastic surgery that kind of has those types of emergencies, which is uh, microsurgery. So I do a lot of reconstruction, which is like moving tissue from one area of the body with tiny little blood vessels and putting them somewhere else and then connecting those blood vessels. So sometimes we have emergencies where those connections kind of stop working. And so we have to go back and fix them. So that's what I was doing last night, but I, I'm excited to be here. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing and a very cool skill set. I can't uh, I can't imagine. So that's fantastic. Well, give us your story if you don't mind. You know the the, yeah. the, the highlight version of where'd you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? Yeah, I started. Um, I guess where where it really kind of started was like the end of my uh, medical training. So I went, you know, four years college, four years medical school, and then my uh, training, like residency and fellowship in plastic surgery, was seven years. So I was at the end of that and I, you know, everyone was kind of telling me like, oh, this is so great. You're going to finally, you know, graduate from being a trainee where you make, you know, pretty meager money to being, you know, a plastic surgeon. You're going to make a ton of money and it's all going to be great. And I was like, well, I don't really feel like it's going to be great because I I've had half a million dollars in debt. I had credit card debt. I had no, I, I was financially clueless. Like I can't. I can't emphasize that enough. Like I knew nothing about personal finance. I spent money as soon as I got it just because I kind of thought that's how it was. I had no savings. I um, had credit card debt that I wasn't paying off, um, et cetera. And I just decided with my wife, like we have to, we have to get this under control because I, I was experiencing burnout in my position, in my um, uh, career. And, and a lot of it I realized was due to the fact that financially I just felt really kind of like behind the eight ball. So mm -hmm. anyway, so we started learning a lot about it. Um, we made a financial plan. I realized that helped a lot with my burnout um, and improved my overall well-being. And then as we were going along, we kind of started hearing everyone talk about real estate. And we, we had the initial reaction I think most people do, which is like, well, we can't do real estate. You know, we don't know anything about it. Like how, how can we do that? And then the we, we kind of just looked around and we saw the other people doing it and we're like the people doing it are just regular people we're regular people why can't we learn about it so we we just started learning about it the same way it initially like i brought it up to my wife and she's like are you are you crazy but she said i'll tell you what like i'll i'll read one book with you and then we'll kind of go from there and so she read um the Millionaire Real Estate Investor, which is a pretty classic one. And, and we read it at the same time. And then she was like, all right, I'm on board. Like, let's do this. So we ended up, um, you know, in our first year, which is just this past year, we bought three properties, two duplexes and one reflex. And um, we, you know, our kind of strategy for buying is we buy a lot based on cash on cash. Um, and so we, we have them all, you know, running at like 25 to 30% cash on cash. We ended up refinancing one to help buy the third one. Um, and my wife is, you know, she'll qualify for real estate professional status this year. Um, 
which is really exciting for us. So we, we really kind of jumped into it and really found that we enjoyed it. We self-manage all our properties, um, you know, which we've been able to do despite, you know, both of us work um, as well. My wife's a professor at a local college. Um, so we, we've kind of just jumped in and it's, I mean, it's been a huge source of our increase in net worth. Like my net worth, when I first checked it, um, kind of at the beginning of the story, was like negative 512,000, I think. And then within one year, the last time I checked it about a month ago was um, like positive 406,000 or something like that. So it was a pretty big jump and real estate was a huge part of that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love I love the, the uh, I can do that attitude. What are some things you would say that helped you? I know reading the book, The Millionaire, The Millionaire, which was a millionaire mindset, is that what it was? The um, millionaire real estate investor. Millionaire real estate investor. What were some of the things that you took away from that and said, okay, and then it gave you the confidence to move forward? I think for us, like, you know, like a lot of people were pretty analytic and it just seemed, you know, when we were thinking of real estate investing, what you kind of hear about is like people buying for market appreciation or, or someone buys something and then a few years later, a market goes crazy and, and, you know, they make a lot of money or there's some like, you know, nebulous crash and they like lose all their money. So it sounds just like a, a gamble. So when we read and we sort of, um, you know, we took away is like, you have to establish your criteria. And if you find properties that meet your criteria, then you buy them. And, you know, it, it's very kind of mathematical or analytical sort of decision-making less less emotional than, you know, buying your primary house or, or something like that. And that just kind of like really struck us and, and kind of fit with, I don't know, our personalities. And we also like, you know, the idea of forced appreciation or, or like that kind of stuff, being able to work and sort of optimize the quote unquote business of your, your rentals to, to increase their value. Um, so those were the real things that, that struck us and sort of really melded with, with us and, and got us excited. Yeah, I think that's that's a commonly missed part of the equation is that, yeah, it's not gambling and, and it is there. There's a very mathematical approach to it. Uh, yeah. I, I like the way you put it where you said, what if, if a property meets your criteria, then you buy it, which then begs the question, starting out, how did you form your criteria? We formed, we we're pretty... Um, conservative and we had there's actually a, a course run by a couple other doctors um, to help people get started in, in small multifamily uh, investing and so we used a lot of of their stuff mixed with uh, Gary Keller's that he presents in that book but we looked for properties uh, in like B C class areas um, that were cash flowing or had the potential to cash flow once they were um, sort of renovated or repaired 10% or greater, which is a pretty, you know, looking back now where we don't get that excited about like 10% because we realized, uh, you know, you can get a lot, a lot more. Um, so, but, but that's kind of what we used. And, and so we had like a, a spreadsheet that essentially we, we put in everything, like what the mortgage is, um, how much we are putting down, what the expected maintenance was, taxes, everything, closing costs. And, um, you know, it would kind of spit out for us what the expected cash on cash. And honestly, we would kind of run like a worst case and a best case scenario. And as long as the worst case, we were coming out, you know, not in the negative, then we were pretty happy because we were like, well, you know, things can really hit the fan. And we're not, we're, we're still basically just have this property that we have people paying off our mortgage for. And, um, you know, that's good for us. But we knew that the best case scenario, it was really going to gonna cash flow in addition. Were there any surprises as you worked your way through those spreadsheets and dumping um, properties into it and going, oh, wait, I thought this would be a great one and it's not? Yeah, totally. I think a lot of like the, the turnkey or, or ones that kind of look, that's not a good way to say it, but, but sometimes the more polished ones that you think, oh, this will be great. But if it's a really polished one in a neighborhood where rents just don't go that high or it's not, it's not meeting the needs of that demographic necessarily, then, you know, we kind of realize those, those aren't great ones. And I think 
that's something we, a lot of our friends or just people in general sort of come to both my wife and I saying, we want to get into this and, and here's this property we saw and they don't realize like, you know, it's some um, like, I don't know, million dollar duplex or something like that where you're like, uh, well, this isn't going to work. Um, so, and I think there were, it, it was really interesting looking at each component of that sort of calculator and how much influence each had on it. Like, you know, everyone talks about interest rates and obviously interest rates right now are super low, which is nice, but you play around with that. You realize interest rate doesn't have a huge, huge impact, which is what a lot of people get held up on. They're like, oh, you know, my lender will only give me this rate or something. And you, you end up realizing that's kind of a minor, minor part and not necessarily what should make or break your decision, but just kind of fun stuff you, you pick up like that. How many properties did you guys look at before you finally got one across the finish line? We looked at, I mean, it was a bunch. It was probably like 15 that, that we physically looked at. We, I mean, like hundreds that we, you know, went through online or Redfin or whatever. Um, we probably walked through 15 and we had a bunch of offers that we put in that, that didn't get taken. And it's, it, especially at the beginning, you're all like amped up and you, you kind of want to get the first one under your belt, but it also was nice because we were just this, the same thing with the criteria. We were like, well, this is how much we'll offer for it because we know in that situation, it, it, it works for what we want. And if not, then so be it. And, you know, we'll, we'll happily move on to the next one. That's uh yeah, I think that's something that people overlook, especially starting out, is the uh, number of times at bat that you have to uh, you have yeah. to have before you actually you know connect with the ball. Talk to us um, about your strategy. I mean, are these long term rentals are they short term rentals? What uh, what are you doing with these properties? Yeah, so so far it, it, they were all long term rentals. Um, you know, we, we are talking about getting into short-term rentals and, and stuff like that, but they're long-term rentals and our, our kind of strategy is buy and, and hold knowing that, you know, the real estate market, like the stock market, you know, over the long-term, it, it tends to go up. There's obviously short-term volatility. Um, but so, you know, we, we kind of have a, a buy and hold strategy. Um, and we're, we're actively accumulating more and sort of, as we started, like I said, I was, I wasn't still am in a huge amount of student debt. So we're paying that off really aggressively. And so the amount of money that we could, we decided to set aside for real estate was more what would buy us in the, you know, small multifamily category. But as we save more and pay off those loans and have more, more capital, then we're actively looking to buy bigger and bigger properties. And then, you know, down the line, um, I'm sure, you know, we'll sell and, and 1031 if that's still an, op an option um, uh, properties for, for more and bigger ones. And I think the end goal would be to have really kind of a, a large multifamily that's sort of, um, you know, automated and, and more like vertically integrated that is, is really kind of just truly more passive. Whereas now it is more active for us and we enjoy that. Right, right. That's uh, that's fascinating. Let's turn let's turn the, uh, the 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 conversation here a little bit and go back to something you said early on. You mentioned I was financially clueless. What does mm -hmm. that mean, and how does that happen to somebody who you know comes out of school and you're a medical doctor? How are you financially clueless? It happens to. It's a huge problem with with doctors. That's why I started my blog because, like looking back now, it, it's just truly simple stuff because, you know, doctors are, are high income earners, but too many doctors, they don't realize like you can make, you know, if you're making a million dollars as a doctor, you're doing really well, but like anyone, you can be an athlete making a million dollars, you spend a million dollars and your net worth is zero, you know, net worth, your income actually factors nowhere in that. For me, that was like mind boggling, you know, like I thought a millionaire was someone who made a million dollars. It's not, it's someone who has a net worth of a million dollars. Um, but we just, in our, you know, like our whole path, we get a lot of education, but none of it is about personal finance. Um, so like I said, I just really had no idea. I mean, I, I um, my loans, the reason they got up to 500,000, they didn't start that way, but I basically just deferred them throughout my whole training and everything. Cause I was so like 
intimidated by it or didn't know how to manage them. So once a year, I would just kind of like close my eyes and click the buttons on the, the loan servicers and deferred another year, which, which was not the right decision. Um, things like how to manage a budget. Like I just really, really didn't know. And it, it's, it seems simple now, like anything, once you kind of learn about it, but there's so many that just, um, I mean, there's so many people in general that just struggle with this stuff, but physicians, especially because they, you know, you go from, you go really quickly from being in training where you're, you're living really kind of meagerly and you have this delayed gratification. And then all of a sudden your income goes up and people just go crazy. They start buying the huge house and the Tesla and all this stuff. And before they know it, they're, they're barely covering their expenses with their high income and there's nothing left to, you know, grow and invest. And in. there's a lot of doctors working a lot longer than they, they want to because they have to. Wow. That, I mean, that's disappointing. You know, you would, you would, yeah. you know, with as smart, uh, as smart as, as, as the group of people that you are, that this would be pretty elementary or at least talked about somewhere, like how to manage your finances based or your basic finances. But I mean, I think across the board, you know, in education across the board, it's missing. I mean, yeah, absolutely. From, you know, first to 12th grade, how many, how many times do those kids come out of high school with a, you know, an understanding of algebra and maybe even calculus, but have no idea the terms of a mortgage? That's exactly, it's so funny. Yeah. And we all see those, like those, those memes or whatever. It's like, you know, I know I do calculus, but like, I really want to know like what taxes are, or, like how to do my taxes, you know? <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh man, what's been one of the the more surprising things that you have discovered while you're blogging and getting responses to those blogs? I think in yeah, that's a good question. I think in general the the surprise has been that most of the response you know what the surprise is that I've got people to read. And I think for me, when I started, I just thought this would be kind of fun to do. And I told myself I'd write for a year. And if, you know, even if nobody was uh, reading and then I would reassess, but, you know, the fact that people have kind of um, related to, you know, what I'm going through. And I think it's unique because I, I'm kind of writing about it as I'm, I'm going through this path that a lot of people are on rather than someone who's kind of already achieved it and then is Kind of like shouting instructions from the finish line which is helpful and a lot of how i learned but um you know so i think that that was surprising um but yeah and and just the the amazing part is how many people you meet like your yourself you know it, it's it's so fun to learn about different people's stories and kind of how they've gotten to the points they're at and that that's definitely been the most fun that's awesome. That's awesome. Talk to us, you know, from the medical doctor perspective, like, are there, are there some overlap or some similarities you see between real estate investing and what you do in your day-to-day -day job where you say, Hey man, this is, these are eerily similar. There definitely is because it's, it, it's also like so eerily similar, but handled so differently in general by, you know, physicians um, in the two areas, because I look at, I guess I'll, I'll say first in terms of like a career trajectory, like again, physicians are super good at delaying gratification and, and sort of having this long-term vision and plan and saying like, all right, I got to jump through this hoop and then that hoop and then whatever, and then I can get to where I want to be. But when it comes to stuff like real estate investing, which is the same type of thing, you, you have to have a long-term vision. You know, I, I think one of the biggest roadblocks for people is they go like, well, I, I'm not going to get rich off of like one property or they go, Oh, I'll buy one duplex and I'll make, I'm just making a number. It's like $25,000 a year. Well, like that doesn't compare to what my income as a physician is. And you go, well, it's, it's not just that, you know, you have to see the long-term vision. They're like, well, then I, I'll have to deal with tenants or I'll have to deal with the property manager. And you're like, yeah, well, you've had to overcome stuff your whole life. Nothing's handed to you. And, you, and you're so good at that, but yet this is, you're going to let it stumble you up. Um, so there's that aspect. And I, and I think that goes also in terms of like the medical plan. You know, if I like see someone for a breast reconstruction, so, you know, for example, I, I'm kind of envisioning the multiple steps down the road and it's, it's the same thing. And, and ultimately, you know, what I like about being a physician and also what I like about real estate is I obviously the, it, it's an investment and that's a primary reason why we're doing it. But 
I, I also like to provide a service and there are people who need housing and, and our goal is to provide, you know, affordable, really nice housing for people who need it. And, and we really pride ourselves on being really good landlords. So that's something that's really nice in dealing with the people aspect in, in both of those areas um, is enjoyable. That's fantastic. My goodness, that's awesome. Are there any resources, uh, you know, maybe technology wise that you have helped leverage as you have grown your portfolio? We use, one we use is, you know, we self-manage, but we use an online property manager tool. Um, it's called Hemley and I don't have like a relationship with them or anything. Um, and there's others, but that's been really nice because it helps us maintain sort of our anonymity. Like they, they know who we are, but they don't know, you know, necessarily that we own it. They think we're the property managers. Um, and so we can handle all the financials through there. So it's a little bit less like um, it, it, it gets more automated. Um, and same thing with like repairs where, you know, now it's just, we get a little ding on our phone that says, you know, something needs to be fixed or whatever. And we just call our handyman or plumber or whatever it is um, and deal with that. Um, other than that, at this point, we're pretty like, I don't know what the term, pretty like analog rather than digital. Like we kind of are, are pretty hands-on, but that has been really helpful for us. Can, can you say the name of that again? I'm not sure I caught that. Oh yeah, it's, it's Hemlane, H-E-M-L-A-N-E. Hemlane, okay, interesting, yeah. very good. Yeah, yeah. And, th and things like that I think are, are, are unique uh, or helpful in when, you're, when you're growing to, like you said, maintain at least a, a marginal bit of uh, anonymity where you're not getting- Yeah, exactly. Right, where your tenants aren't texting you at, at 3 a.m. going, hey, what, uh, what are we doing with this? Well, <laughs> that's, been, that's fantastic. What has been maybe one surprising thing that you wouldn't have expected? Maybe now, I guess you said you're a year in on this journey or two years yeah. in on this journey. What's been something that you hadn't expected uh, and upon a positive note? I think, um, you know, what I didn't expect at all is I'm not a, a around the house, like handy person. And you know what, this actually goes back to your earlier question, what is a similarity? Um, but that's one positive that I've got out of this is I've learned to do a lot of new stuff that I found that I kind of enjoy. I mean, obviously based on what I chose in my profession, I like to fix things, but I never really like applied that to the house. But it, the, the thing that's funny in the comparison is, you know, I can remember being a, a surgical intern and, and maybe there was some problem like someone had in the emergency department and you literally, it, it may be the middle of the night, you're the only person in the hospital and you'll, you'll sort of like read up on it or, or watch a YouTube video on how to do it. And then you just go and do it. It's the same thing, you know, like the tenant would call me like, oh, this is broken. I'm like, yeah, you know, I bet I can figure out how to fix that. So I'll watch a YouTube video and then go fix it. Um, so that's been a, a, a fun surprise for me, like something that I enjoy doing that I didn't know before. Right. No, that's fascinating. That's that, those are things you don't think about, uh, you know, from this side of the this side of the table going. There, yeah, <laughs> there, there, there might be a plastic surgeon at 2 a.m. watching a YouTube video on how to. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> that's hysterical. Jordan, I've super enjoyed this. Thanks for coming on the show today. Before we jump into the final four questions, do you have any parting thoughts or words of advice to our listeners? I, I think the biggest parting thought or, or words of advice is like, I can't. I can't overstate how, you know, normal or green we were when, when we started, I say we, my wife and I, but we just decided to do it and jump in and, and you never feel ready. So if this is something you want to do, go for it. Just don't, don't, uh, don't wait until you're ready. Don't wait for whatever, you know, landmark you've set for yourself to start, just start. That's awesome. I love that. Final four questions are this, if I gave you 20,000 bucks to invest in real estate, what would you do with it and why? I, I would use it towards a down payment for a small multifamily property. That's, that's what I know. And I know I could get that cash back out pretty quick and, um, you know, have cash flow and then start buying another property and, and snowball on that. Love it. If you could help our listeners avoid one mistake in real estate, what would it be and how would you avoid it? Uh, try to buy properties where you don't inherit the tenants. Mm -hmm. that we learned that uh, the hard way with our last property. Yeah, that's uh that's a good one. Been there, done that. And yeah, it's a gamble. Sometimes it's worth <laughs> it's a gamble. Out, and sometimes yeah. it hasn't. So yeah. Completely understand. That's a great piece of advice. Question number three, when it comes to investing in the world, what's one way you're making the world a better place? 
I think, like I said, it, I really look at investing in, in especially these multifamily properties as providing really good housing. You know, I'm not trying to be, you know, just take as much money out of it as I can. Like, I really want to provide a service and and help people. Um, and I think that's that's a really nice thing about this way of investing. Absolutely. Great. Jordan, I've enjoyed it. If a listener's want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? You can uh, check out my site, prudentplasticsurgeon.com. You can contact me right through there, or my email is jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, at prudentplasticsurgeon.com, and you can just email me anytime. Awesome. Jordan, thank you so much for your time today. Really enjoyed it. Of course. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen. If you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.